Agency From the book The Myths of Normal Trauma, Illness and Healing in a Toxic Culture by Gabor Mate and Daniel Mate Agency is the capacity to freely take responsibility for our existence exercising responsibility in all essential decisions that affect our lives to every extent possible. Being deprived of agency is a source of stress. Such deprivation could arise from social or political conditions poverty, injustice, marginalization, or the seeming collapse of the world around us. In the case of illness, it's often due to internal constraints. The exercise of agency is powerfully healing. As with authenticity, capitalism sells a bogus version of agency through personal power mantras like be all you can be and have it your way. Personal choice becomes a brand with no attention paid to the contexts in which those choices are made. Often the freedom being advertised is the dubious freedom to choose between this or that identity burnishing product or service that will not, cannot satisfy us. Nor does agency mean some sort of false omnipotence or ultimate dominion over all happenings and circumstances. Life is so much bigger than us and we do not forward our own healing by pretending to be in control where we are not. Agency does mean having some choice around who and how we be in life, what parts of ourselves we identify with and act from. This often starts with renegotiating our relationship with the personality traits we have so long taken to be identical with who we really are, the ones that first arouse in us to keep us safe, but now keep us boxed in. There is no freedom in having to be good or the most talented or accomplished or in the need to please or entertain or be interesting. Nor can we wield agency when we react with automatic opposition to other people's demands. Knee-jerk reactivity leaves no room for responsibility or what in our first chapter we called response flexibility, a capacity trauma greatly impairs. Agency is neither attitude nor effect, neither blind acceptance nor a rejection of authority. It is a self-bestowal of the right to evaluate things freely and fully, and to choose based on authentic gut feelings, deferring to neither the world's expectations nor the dictates of ingrained personal conditioning. A distinction must be made between accepting and tolerating. Being with something and putting up with something have precious little to do with each other. Acceptance is 
vitalizing because it makes room for the other three A's. It grants admission to anger if such is present, increases our sense of free agency and makes room for whatever our authentic experience might be. Tolerating the intolerable, on the other hand, is deadening. For example, resigning oneself bleakly to conditions such as abuse or neglect involves rejecting crucial parts of one's self, needs and values that deserve to be respected and integrity that needs to be safeguarded. That is far from true acceptance. Promote healing. Authenticity, agency, anger and acceptance. And add two more that are required for the pursuit of broad transformational change. Activism and advocacy. The last two are socially meaningful ways of synthesizing the previous four with some added ingredients, solidarity, collective thinking and connection to help counter capitalism's atomizing effects. Part of advocacy is to use whatever privilege we may have to amplify the voices of those to whom society denies a voice. Part of activism is organizing groups of people to demand necessary change. Both express a healthy, necessary no, often accompanied by a resounding yes, for example, to a concrete policy goal. Seek trauma as an internal dynamic grants us much needed agency. If we treat trauma as an external event, something that happens to or around us, then it becomes a piece of history we can never dislodge. If, on the other hand, trauma is what took place inside us as a result of what happened in the sense of wounding or disconnection, then healing and reconnection become tangible possibilities. Trying to keep awareness of trauma at bay hobbles our capacity to know ourselves. Conversely, fashioning from it a rock-hard identity. Whether the attitude is defiance, cynicism or self-pity, is to miss both the point and the opportunity of healing, since, by definition, trauma represents a distortion and limitation of who we were born to be. Facing it directly without either denial or over-identification becomes a doorway to health and balance. Another lamentable feature of Western medical practice, not universal but all too often see, is a power hierarchy that casts physicians as the exalted experts and patients as the passive recipients of care. For all doctors, dedication and goodwill, the imbalance compromises patients' agency over their own health 
and healing process. Essential questions about their lives go unasked, while patients in turn lack the confidence to insist that their intuitions and insights about themselves contribute to the process, much less guide it. What if we saw illness as an imbalance in the entire organism, not just as a manifestation of molecules, cells or organs invaded by or denatured by pathology? What if we applied the findings of Western research and medical science in a systems framework seeking all the connections and conditions that contribute to illness and health. Such a reframing would revolutionize how we practice medicine, rather than treating disease as a solid entity that imposes its ill will on the body, we would be dealing with a process, one that can't be extricated from our personal histories and the context and culture in which we live. This change in approach has much to recommend it and not only because it takes interpersonal biology into account. When we cease to view illness as a concrete, autonomous thing, with a predetermined trajectory, and when we have the proper help and a willingness to look both within and without, we can start to exercise agency in the matter. If disease is a manifestation of something in our lives rather than merely a cruel disruptor, we have options. We can pursue new understandings, ask new questions, perhaps make new choices. We can take our rightful place as active participants in the process, rather than remain its victims helpless but for our reliance on medical miracle workers. Disease itself is both a culmination of what came before and a pointer to how things might unfold in the future. Our emotional dynamics, including our relationship to ourselves, can be among the powerful determinants of that future, an attitude of helplessness and hopelessness at the time of diagnosis, for example, has been shown to exert a marked adverse effect on survival. No conceivable condition exists under which a human being has less agency or fewer options than in infancy and early childhood. The imperative to survive overrides everything, and that survival depends on the maintenance of attachment at whatever cost to authenticity. This is why so many childhoods, particularly in a culture that both breeds stress and feeds on it, are marked by a tense standoff between the two, where the outcome is predictable and the consequences are lifelong. Dolman's subsequent two births were her redemption, the reclaiming of full agency, under the care 
of a midwife, she succeeded in a joyful vaginal birth at the completion of her third pregnancy, though she described it as very, very painful. She counts it among the most amazing and exhilarating experiences of her life, as is the case for so many women. Dolman's license to make her own choices was key to getting to the other side of the suffering. No matter how painful it got, I had support and I was in control of my own body. That was very empowering to me, no matter what came my way. Being in charge of my own body was what it came down to. Ten years later, the telling of it still brought tears to her eyes. Tears of joy. The term mental illness, even as it describes real phenomena, focuses our attention centrally on brain physiology, analogous to how, say, anginal pain controls a restriction of oxygen supply to the heart muscle owing to narrowed cardiac arteries. It also implies that the problem necessarily falls within the domain of medicine. Despite whatever partial truths they contain, these assumptions are highly questionable and limit our understanding. Worse, they generate harm, both in the sense that they leave many people subjected to inappropriate treatments and in that they displace perspectives that could be far more complete, humane and helpful. The biological determinism that governed Daryl Hammond's physicians also placed his condition beyond his own agency to heal thereby reinforcing the you are the only one that has no power story he spoke of. Such a view threatens to keep the sufferer largely in the position of passively receiving treatment. His symptoms ameliorated by medications to be ingested in many cases for a lifetime. In its predominantly biological approach, psychiatry commits the same error as other medical specialties. It takes complex processes, intricately bound with life experience and emotional development slaps the disease label on them and calls it a day. Edith's survival and, far beyond that, her transcendence of the horrors she endured are depicted in her book The Choice. What choice could she mean? Certainly not the choice of when and where she was born, or what befell those closest to her. Rather, she found a way to exercise the only agency she had, which lay in her own point of view and emotional attitude toward the unchangeable past. When asked what she got from her self-denial, she said, it's that sense of control and also self-acceptance. It made me feel better about myself because I had control of what I was doing essentially. Although she recalled 
a not bad childhood her mother casey who participated in our interview was able to correct the record she and her husband divorced when andrea was six after years of intense marital stress a child in such circumstances is prone to lack of self-acceptance and yearns for agency in an emotionally unstable environment this desperate drive to seize some command at least of their own body amid turmoil is almost universal among people with anorexia or bulimia that I have interviewed. The psychologist Julie T. Ann, who specializes in treating eating disorders, nails it. With her client, she says, three lacks are typical, lack of control, identity, and self-worth, along with the need to numb pain. In a relational world, the human psyche devises a brilliant means to emotionally survive, she told me. In our culture, this becomes the pursuit of perfection vis-à-vis -vis the body and self. Not everyone will or ought to work with shamans or psychotropic plants. Relatively few people are likely to even have such an opportunity. That doesn't matter. My particular experience, though under unusual circumstances, was suffused with the universal healing principles that guide this book's exploration and which are available to all. The acceptance, the shedding of identity, the choosing to trust the inner guidance against the remonstrations of the conditioned mind and the genuine agency that springs paradoxically from the willingness to give up rigid control. If I can do it, I am convinced that anyone can. Anyone, that is, who commits to their healing and allows it to instruct them rather than the other way around. My experience with the shamans in Peru also taught me something about what healing is not. For years, I had retained a fixed idea that to heal, I'd have to go through some monumental cathartic release, as I've seen happen for others, or perhaps travel back in time in some way to relieve or redeem the difficult past. Yes, it can take that form, but not necessarily. Once again, it is not the past that has to change or can change, only our present relationship to ourselves.